Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. Let's start out with a very well-known prayer um, uh, to the guardian angel, all right? In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love commits me here, ever this day be at my side, to light and guard, to rule and guide. Somebody say amen. Right. Yeah, let's get right into uh, talking about the guardian angels. And um, um, we, we begin, I think it's a very well <clears throat> attested in the scriptures uh, and certainly in the tradition of the church. The catechism is very clear that we're, we're all given a guardian angel. So we, we start out, though, like, for example, St. Basil, St. Basil, one of the church fathers, he's um, in the Genesis text, uh, in a uh, text indicating our guardian angels. It's not the first text you think to go to. It's from Genesis 48, but it has um, Israel, also known as Jacob, uh, blessing his sons just before he dies, giving them the patriarchal blessings. And um, it says, and Israel, that is to say, J uh, Jacob, blessed Joseph, his son, and said, the God before whom my fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and, uh, Abraham, Isaac uh, walked, and the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day, and the angel who has delivered me from all evil. May you all bless these sons of mine and let my name be carried on and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac. So again, he references the angel who all his life has led him through danger. So there's a reference here to his angel. Now, some of the more um, common ones, common texts that we go to in the Bible that indicate that we do have a guardian angel is, for example, uh, Matthew in, in the 18th chapter, it says, where the Lord says, See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Now, by the way, often we hear when, when the Lord talks about these little ones, we often think he's talking about little kids. In a way, there are a couple of times where he is speaking particularly of children, as we would use the word. But more often than not, he simply uses the word little ones and my little ones to refer to all of us, his disciples. Um, so, uh, you know, you don't want to limit um, this idea. There, it, there's a, I, I'm sure that some of you speak Spanish or other languages. There's a use, a more common use of the diminutive, which is not demeaning or treating someone like a child, but it's a sign of affection. So, for example, my name in English is, is, is Charles. The diminutive in English is Charlie. In Spanish, it's Carlitos, you know, and, um, and so... But that's what God calls me. He calls me Carlito, you know. <laughs> um, but I think what I want to say is that these, when, when there, there was a moment, remember when the Lord was at the lakeside and he called out to them, uh, he'd, he'd risen from the dead and he calls out to them, to full grown men, he says, little children, have you caught anything? And they answer back, not a thing, sir. Now they don't get indignant that they're being called little children. Uh, it's a sign of affection, all right? So, but again, just remember that very often, the term little ones is not simply a reference to children. It certainly includes them, but it really includes any of his disciples who are vulnerable to error and to confusion and to being deceived. And the Lord gets very, very angry when anyone would try to deceive one of his little ones. I mean, there's almost nothing that makes the Lord angrier. He said it would be better for him to be thrown into the lake with a millstone around his neck than to deceive one of these little ones. So again... Uh, take take care, you know, some of these traveling heretics and priests for hire and some of these other ones that are running around confusing God's people. God is not pleased and he gets very angry. So again, the idea is that all of us who are his little ones, our angel constantly beholds the face of God in heaven. And what a beautiful thought. And you say, well, how can an angel see the Father in heaven and be down here with me? And, and again, remember... <clears throat> We um, uh, human beings have to schlep our body. We're at a place and a time. Angels can travel at the speed of thought, be instantly in one place and another. So again, these things uh, we, we want to keep in mind um, are certainly possible for the angels. 
Now then Psalm 91, there's another well-known verse that speaks about angels caring for us. It says, for God, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. So their, their job is to kind of protect us. Now, but every now and again, of course, we still fall. We still have some bumps and grinds. But again, only those that God permits um, for some greater purpose. So here too, again, it's not like the angel will prevent us from every single mishap. But rather, again, that the idea of dashing our foot against a stone is, is, is um, it's an image of scandal, right? Um, um, there, you know, there's a, you know, the, the Lord says, blessed are you who find no scandal, no stumbling block in me, you know. So the word scandal, scandalon, refers to a stumbling block or a stone over which somebody trips and falls. It's not so much a physical fall, but a moral fall or a fall into error um, and so on that uh, the Lord wants to protect us from. So, you know, just because you tripped and fell doesn't mean the angel wasn't on the job, okay? Um, but rather the fundamental stone that we not dash our foot against would be the, the, the stone of scandal, the, the, the stumbling block that scandal is uh, for us, okay? Now, first of all, I mean, I don't want to, I don't have time to read you the whole book of Tobit today, but really the whole book of Tobit shows Raphael coming to the aid of, of, of Tobias and Tobit. Now, I will say that, that that may not be a guardian angel in particular. Raphael is one of the archangels, uh, but he may have been dispatched to assist the guardian angel. But the idea that the angels are involved in helping us, protecting us, getting us out of dangers to be sure, but also assisting us uh, to keep the faith. Now here then is another passage from the, from the Acts of the Apostles. And you may remember that Peter was arrested by Herod and was going to be tried. And uh, let's pick up the story there. I'm reading from Acts in the 12th chapter. It says that uh, Peter was sleeping in, in the jail between two soldiers bound with change. You know, by the way, that's overkill, y'all, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> it's like, you know, come on, man. This is just Peter, right? But anyway, okay. Um, and, and the sentries are before the door. They were guarding the prison. But behold, in the middle of the night, an angel of the Lord stood next to Peter. And a light shone in the cell. And he struck Peter on the side and woke him up and said, get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, dress yourself now, put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. Um, and um, he did not know this was being done by, an, whether this angel was real or he was just maybe having a vision or a dream. But when Peter came to himself, he said, you know, the angel leads him out. I'm, I'm skipping some verses. Peter said, now I am sure that the Lord sent his angel to rescue me. So he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many of the disciples were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked on the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice in her joy, she did not open the gate. <laughs> but she ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. And they said to her, you're out of your mind. Uh, but she kept insisting it was so. And they said, it must be his angel. Okay. Now, that's a long kind of quote. But basically, it's affirming that not only do angels help us, but that Peter has an angel. And the early Christians are asserting that it, 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 Peter's in jail. He can't be free. But maybe his angel is standing at the door. But again, the, the point here is to affirm that we have an angel who's appointed to guard over us, all right? Now, therefore, um, scriptures like these, or other as scriptures besides, but scriptures like these lead the fathers of the church to conclude clearly that we all have a guardian angel. Let me just read you some quotes. Origen says, we must say that every human soul is under the direction of an angel who is like a father to him, okay? Now, be, you hear that image, father? We, we've, I've talked about this in our other sessions, but be careful not to trivialize the angels, you know, um, and turn them into little fluffy things that are almost more like pets. Um, we, we, our, our, our angels are meant to guard us. We to obey them. They, they're more in the role of like a father or a strong warrior or, or, or teacher on our behalf. You know, I, 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 I'm like anybody, you know, I have these kind of little, nice little sentimental angels around and She's real pretty and all, but at the end of the day, I've got some fiercer angels too. I've got Raphael and Ori, and I've got some of the, the other ones we use in exorcisms and stuff. But again, at the end of the day, be, just be careful not to overly sentimentalize. We have we owe respect above all uh, to the angels. So Origen says, uh, we're under the direction of an angel and he's like unto us like a father, okay? Now ba Basil, St. Basil says, an angel is put in charge of every believer 
provided that we do not drive him out by sin. And he guards our soul like an enemy. Okay. Now, by the way, as, fa as Father Hezekiah was saying earlier, not everything that comes out of the, the church father's mouths is doctrine. Uh, it's, it's their opinions. They're reliable fellows for all the reasons he stated. They give us the kind of the a sure window into the thinking of the early church. Um, but not everything is, is absolutely attested as doctrine or dogma. So I would say that I wouldn't necessarily entirely agree with Basil, Basil that even if we sin, we lose our guardian angel. Because, in, in fact, I think we read elsewhere that very often, you know, the angel is there to rebuke us and to bring us back to the Lord. Uh, the angel is there in our life even before we're baptized. Uh, the most common opinion is that every human person, not just believers, have an angel assigned to them. And we'll, we'll read that more in a minute, okay? So, again, um, like Eusebius says, God, fearing, uh, you know, he's speaking of God here, fearing lest sinful, uh, sinful mankind should be without government and without guidance like herds of cattle. <laughs> God gave us protectors and superintendents, the holy angels, in the form of captains and shepherds. And um, his firstborn son is set above all these. By the way, I don't know if you noticed this, but in a number of places, um, the Lord is referred to, Lord Jesus, as an angel. He's presented that way in the book of Revelation at times. He takes up the form of an angel. Uh, he's not an angel. He's, uh, he's God and also a man. But he's referred to as an angel in, in a certain sense because, remember, angels are ministers and they bring God's message to us. Well, who did that far excellent than Jesus, right? So, again, um, we see here. A reference to that. Now, by the way, how do you like being comp compared to herds of cattle? All right, <laughs> that's what he's talking about, you know. Man. Now, uh, Saint Hilary says, in the warfare we carry on to remain strong against evil powers, the angels are our necessary helpers. So again, we're in a war, we're in combat, we're in battle. We need angels to protect us, to lead us, to give us battle strategies, to warn us. You see the idea. Uh, we're, we're at war. Now, unfortunately, an awful lot of Christians, uh, Catholics among them, have lost any sense that we're in a war. They're just like, oh, I'm on TV. I'm sure everything will be fine. Uh, again, uh, we have to remember we're in, a, we're in war. You know, the, the church is not a cruise ship. It's a battleship. Huh? All right. So we see that the, the first thing I wanted to talk about with the role of our guardian angels is just that we have guardian angels. And I think we've established that. And I don't think any of you doubt it much, but just to, so you see these scriptures come to us and the church fathers meditating upon them indicate both that we have guardian angels and that we need guardian angels. All right. Now, with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about some of the roles of our guardian angels. St. Athanasius says that in opposition to the turmoil into which demons throw the soul, the vision of angels works softly and peaceably, awakening joy and exultation. So, you know, I don't, every now and again, I, 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 like you, sometimes feel like I'm maybe under demonic attack. There's a sadness that I can't explain or an anxiety that suddenly comes upon me. I don't know why, a, a dread or something like that. And again, remember, this, is, this could well be a, simply a demonic attack uh, in the form of a temptation or maybe an oppression. Listen, remember, you got an angel. And, and the angels are more powerful than demons. And call on your angel and ask the angel to help you. You might also ask someone else to pray over you. But again, as St. Athanasius says, you know, we're, we're in, a, we're in a, a life that has its ups and downs. We're in a battle. And at times, some of the attacks that the demons make in our life is that they, 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 they throw turmoil into our life. And they throw sadness and sorrow. And it says, in opposition to all this turmoil into which demons throw the soul, the, um, the vision of angels works, uh, the, the mission of angels works softly and peaceably, awakening joy and exultation. So at times like those, call to your angel, you know, people say, I need to call the exorcist. <laughs> All right, you maybe you do, <laughs> but, but uh, don't forget to call on your angel and the Lord. All right. Okay. Somebody say amen. All right. Uh, with that in mind, other terms that the fathers and scripture delineate the functions of angels. So the fathers will use terms like these, um, and so does scripture, that angels are our guardians. They are our guard. They're our protector, our superintendent, our overseer, our assistant, our shepherd, our herdsman, our instructor. All right. So all of these are ways. Now, that last one, instructor, is very important. I believe, really, that the Lord mediates his words to your soul, usually through your guardian angel, through the angels in general, but in particular, your guardian angel. So when you have a qualm of conscience or you, you, you have some insight uh, into what is to be said or done, 
be, be, be close to your guardian angel. They say, guardian angel, help me out here. I, I mean, or listen, when you're, when you're feeling a qualm of conscience or a warning or even a reprimand, be careful to remember that uh, part of what might be happening is that your guardian angel is interacting with you, okay? By the way, I, I experience a lot of that when I'm preaching and, and teaching. I mean, I, I don't know sometimes where I, how do I remember what I remember and things just pop in at the right moment. And I mean, some of that comes from a long amount of study. I see a few, you have a few books on your shelves over there. I see those books over there, Bill, but having read all these, yes, I, I know it's somehow in there, but how, how do I access it? How do I have the thing at the right moment just when I need them? I'm so grateful at times, yes, to God, but also to my guardian angel and to maybe the empowering angel that a priest might also have. But there's just something I experience that it's more than just me at a moment like this where I'm teaching, or it's more than just me, it's certainly in the preaching moment. And, you know, I, I, my, my people at Daily Mass kind of laugh at me. I mean, I'm, I'm a little sleepy in the morning and I kind of show up a little bit frumpy and I'm looking for the right page in the sacramentary. And, but I tell you, it comes to the preaching moment and I'm like, I'm fixed and I'm ready to go. And then I, after the homily, I kind of go back to, uh, let's see, uh, where's the, <laughs> anyway, but it's, it's an amazing, I would call it an assistance, you know, that I feel from the angels and from God and his grace. So be open to that and be grateful, be grateful when you have those moments. Now then let's read on. Um, angels do not only protect and console, but they also reprimand us and punish us and they exhort us to do penance. All right. The shepherd of Hermas says, we are, uh, we are not at first chastised by God, the father, uh, or, or, who is the father of the family himself, but by the angels whom he has sent to us as masters over us, that uh, uh, with the office of chastising and correcting each one of us. So again, this is why respect is due to our angels, right? They're not just someone here just to console us and make us feel happy and ass assist us. Th those things are true. But the angel, if he's doing his job, also warns, admonishes, and even at times brings forth certain punishments for us, all right? So um, now Origen says, he, if there are good thoughts in our heart, let there be no doubt that the angel of the Lord is speaking to us. But if evil things come into our heart, let there be no doubt that an angel of the evil one is speaking to us. In other words, a demon. And we, we, we realize that we're in a battle and our angels are there to assist us. But an awful lot of the battleground, y'all, is our thoughts, right? The re the chief battleground is our mind. And so we've got to ask the Holy Spirit to assist us, God, God himself, but also the angels who are God's messengers. And the word angel means messenger. So holy angel, inspire me, uh, let, help me to see things I need to see and not see things I shouldn't be seeing. Uh, help me to, uh, to listen to the better voices and, and ignore the evil ones, right? So... Uh, angels also assist in prayer and transmit our petitions to God. All the fathers say this. And there's a whole chapter, by the way, uh, on the angels' role in our prayer. You know, you might wonder, well, why does God do this? You know, if he um, can't God hear us directly. But for, what, for reasons of his own, God has chosen to mediate his communication to us and our communication to him through the ministry of the angels. Uh, God, they are God's messengers. He, they bring God's messages to us and they bring our messages uh, to God. So your angel is assisting you in your prayer and bringing your, bringing your own prayers and petitions uh, before God. So work with your guardian angel. Say, guardian angel, I'm feeling a little sleepy this morning, but you know what's in my heart. Tell it to God for me. <laughs> now the angel can't pray for you, but can assist you in your prayers, right? Okay. Now, opinion is divided over whether non-believers have guardian angels. St. Thomas says, yes, they do. However, he adds, though, that... Um, uh, a guardian angel uh, is an entirely new role for the baptized. You know, for the unbaptized, if your guardian angel is up against it, man. The demons have almost free range. Uh, the, the devil is the prince of this world, and they have certain legal rights, if you will, over, over the unbaptized that they don't have over those who are baptized. So he says, so Thomas says, a guardian angel has an entirely new role after baptism. For indeed, before baptism, Satan has certain legal rights. We can talk about that more in a minute. He has certain legal rights over people, and the angels can only set limits to what the devils can do. But baptism reverses the situation and increases the power of the angels to defend us. Now, you might say, what legal rights does the devil have over me, and why is that, and so on, all right? Well, I'm going to just tell you right now, when we're in sin, we are conniving. 
with the devil. We're kind of saying, I'm kind of with you on this, buddy. And we kind of give him a certain degree of authority in our life. And he obtains certain legal, I say legal, not moral, but legal rights over us. And even in exorcism, one of the first things that um, a demon will, will say to the exorcist is, listen, uh, he's mine, gave himself to me, you know, or she gave her, she gave herself to me. It's mine, mine, you know, and you have to begin to break any legal hold through renunciation. You get the person to do renunciation, to renew their baptismal vows. You, you, you have to break these ties that the demons think they have a legal right to be there. You remember the, um, the Gerasene demoniac who came running up to Jesus and said, what have you to do with us, Jesus, son of God, most high? Have you come to throw us out before the appointed time? In other words, that they think that for now they have a time for a certain appointed time until they have to go. And Jesus is coming to shorten that. And uh, Jesus doesn't deny. He says, you've never had a right to be here. He doesn't get into that with them. He doesn't. He just says, he negotiates with them and then sends them out into the pigs. But again, you see the idea there. There is a certain sense that through our own sinfulness, we invite the presence or the uh, influence of the devil into our lives through and his demons. And they claim those rights. And they say, you agreed. Uh, you were with us on these things. And um, we're not just going to let go, you know. Uh, just because you say, go away now. We're going to uh, kind of be like the, uh, the jilted lover. We're going to keep calling. <laughs> All right. Now, so again, part of the job of exorcism is to break those legal rights and to cancel them. And, and you work with the person to do that, and then they have no more legal standing or no more legal right, and they have to go. Now, John Chrysostom says also this about angels, that, uh, that among the faithful, those who have higher offices in the church are the object of special protection and assistance. The virtues of heaven are always with those who are charged with such offices. Therefore, I told you before, I, there's a kind of a pious tradition um, or a common opinion that priests have an empowering angel. God, of course, gives priests this power by configuring them to himself, but um, the bottom line is that you know, there, there, there is some, some mechanism by which God enables our ministry or unlocks it, and the same for bishops and others, okay? So anyway, maybe the conclusion to say here in the section on the guardian angels would be this, that we live, therefore, in the middle of a supernatural world, all right? and a spectacle wherein everything that appears empty is in fact filled with angels all round about us. Yes, we're surrounded by all the angels. You might remember I said last week, I quoted that passage from Kings where Elisha's servant felt like that as he saw the city being surrounded by armies, he was terrified. And so Elisha prayed and said, open his eyes, Lord, so he can see the real situation. And it says, God opened up the eyes of the servant of Elisha and he saw myriads and thousands of uh, chariots of fire and angels round about Elisha. And so again, if only our eyes could be opened, we would see the magnificent presence of the angels all around us. So I think right here we'll stop for some questions on guardian angels and any of you on the panel might have, um, you know, might have the capacity, I mean, you, know, you want to ask directly and then answer some of the questions in the cue box. Uh, Monsignor, regarding the proper discernment of whether or not your guardian angel or some other spirit guiding you, any thoughts, anything from the, the fathers on that? I can't say that I, I read any of those in the books now. I mean, again, but I think common sense has to say to us, you know, that we need to be discerning. And we, the angel doesn't replace our discernment or our, our own mental capacities. So we have to listen. You know, sometimes something could sound good. But it's not the right thing. You know, for example, whenever we do discernment, sometimes we think, well, I'm called to do this or that, but our state in life or our gifts don't line up with it. Or, um, uh, you know, it isn't always something that's sinful or bad, but it's maybe just something that's not really the will of God for us. You know, say, for example, I mean, a woman comes with five, five young children and she says, I think God is calling me to pray six hours a day in Eucharistic adoration. So I'm going to say, I don't think so. Um, you know, you, 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 you've got, uh, you've got other duties that are important right now. And, um, um, you know, maybe an hour a day, how about that? You know, so, so I think, uh, Bill, the, the best I can say with that is that we, um, we have to listen carefully, but, um, the angels of course are always prompting and assisting us to do that, but we do have our work to do as well. I had a, a quick question. Monty. Go ahead, Frank. Go ahead. Frank. Uh, yeah. I read not so long ago in one of the biographies on Padre Pio. He rebuked his guardian angel when one time, you know, he, uh, his guardian angel kind of let him let Padre Pio get beat up pretty good in one of his bouts with um, the demons and other things that were afflicting him. 
guardian angel is kind of laughing about the incident and Padre Pio rebuked rebuke his guardian angel about the incident. I, I'm not, I'm just. Only saints can be so bold. Uh, you may remember <laughs> another story. I think of, of St. Teresa of Avila, was it? Uh, she fell off her horse and she kind of got angry with God and said, this is how you treat your friends. No, long, no wonder you have so few. You know, um, I think that at times, you know, uh, don't take too seriously some of these stories. I think even saints and Padre Pio is a saint now. Doesn't mean that he was already canonized when he was a younger man or even in his old age. It simply means that uh, he might have gotten a little vexed. And where were you when I needed you? <laughs> I mean, even the Psalms take up this language of protest, right? Some of the Psalms are in the form of a reed, like a lawsuit against God. So they start out like, "Who's quiet, called Domine? Huh? How much longer, O Lord? Huh? My, will my enemy triumph? Or I call out to you day after day and you don't answer." See, it's almost in the form of a, a lawsuit against God, a protest, and that and anger. And God, in a way, is saying, look, I already know how you feel. Let's just get it out on the table. I know you're angry. You're disappointed. You think I'm slow. Uh, go ahead and talk. Make that your prayer. It's, it's, it's an amazing in the Psalms, isn't it? The, the freedom that God gives us to cry out with every human emotion, right? And um, at times, you know, we want to be careful. We don't ever go so far as to blaspheme or do something terrible. But God kind of wants us to spar with them a little bit, to, to duke it out with them a little bit in prayer. And I think I, I see some of that in Padre Pio there. Uh, but again, saints can be bold in ways that maybe we should be cautioned against. <laughs> Monsignor, we got a question coming in um, online uh, regarding the, the ministry of the angels. Kind of wh what does it mean for the angels to minister to God? You know, what is, and, and then what does God need? There are things due to God. Adoration, praise, announcing of his glory manifesting his glory to others um, in a mediated kind of a way. Uh, we, we cannot endure the, the glory of God unveiled and so on. So I think these are the ways that, that they minister God. So as his messengers, uh, he sends out his word through them because he is due honor and praise and glory. And they sing God's praise and glory in, in, in heaven. And, and, and not so much that God needs these things, but, but that it is fit or due to him. And so they're rendering what is just, what is right, and what is due. Now, there is, isn't there an interesting, um, well, I forget, I forget how it is, uh, where it comes from, but there's this there's a kind of an old expression. Jesus says to us, I now have no voice but yours. I have no hands but yours. So in a way, we minister to God. We, we accomplish his works, even as the angels do that invisibly. So I think maybe that's the best way to see ministry. Maybe if you want to add, Father, but... I think that the ministry isn't so much that God needs something like I need a glass of water or something. It's not like that, but rather that, uh, that there are things due to God that ought to be injustice done. Yeah. We can understand that in terms of our own worship of the Lord. Yeah. Uh, we're not adding, adding anything to his glory. We need, this is, this is offered an invitation for us to, to find our true end, our true glory in mm -hmm. bowing down before our maker. So yeah, and don't you detest that attitude where people go to church, eh, I wasn't fed today. Peel me a grape. You know? <laughs> and again, I hope that people are fed, and, and we don't want to just dismiss that people need things from the liturgy. But at the end of the day, we go to Mass, we go to the Divine Liturgy, because God is worthy of our praise. St. Thomas puts the virtue of religion not under uh, faith, you know, the supernatural virtue of faith, but under the natural virtue of justice. God is due. He is worthy of our praise, and it is due to him, and we owe it to him. And so it's first and foremost a duty in justice. Hopefully it's also subsumed under our love for God and also our, our supernatural gift of faith. But at the end of the day, we owe it. And there ought to be, there ought to be a sacrifice of praise. You know, it's not always going to be your favorite song or your favorite sermon or the preacher's always on his game or, or, or. And so somewhere along the line, yeah, this idea that the angels of God render the justice due to God by praising them. You know, this idea of liturgy as the work of the people, the work of God's people. And this, you know, we get a sense of uh, this is why I, I always stress this point. There's no such thing as liturgical sitting. Okay, I hate it. Please sit. That's not a command of the liturgy. The liturgy stand up to do the work of Jesus Christ, the work of the Lord, to bow down and worship Him. And yeah. Him again, yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah, in the most ancient churches, there were no pews, right? <laughs> well, we're going to move now into a very sensitive thing: uh, death. What happens when we die? What is the role of the angels in our death? 
and um, there's some very beautiful and some very tender things here, and some exciting and thrilling things. So let's get started. We first of all let's start with the scripture and liturgical roots of the role of the angels. It says here, it talks about Lazarus. Remember Lazarus and the rich man. And it says, when Lazarus died, it says, the time came when Lazarus the beggar died, and angels carried him to Abraham's side, or Abraham, the bosom of Abraham, right? So they carry him to the heart of Abraham. Who does the angels do that, right? There's the offertory uh, prayer for, uh, and the requiem mass for the, um, in the extraordinary form um, that implores Michael the archangel and standard bearer, may he lead us forward into the holy light, promise of old to Abraham and his seed. So again, the prayer is that made him made Michael, and at the time of our death, may Michael the archangel lead us forward, lead us forward and upward to God, to the holy light promised to us. By the way, that prayer is rooted in, 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 in uh, Jude chapter 1 and verse 9. You remember that uh, uh, Satan and, and Michael were, were in a dispute over the body of Moses. Guess who won, right? But on the other hand, the point is that uh, there is a care that this is why that prayer has that wording. Because um, somehow the scripture just indicates that Michael had a particular role in, in rescuing the body as well as the soul of Moses out of, uh, out of the snatches of the devil and uh, making sure that Moses came to that holy place. There is a, because nobody knows his grave, there was a sense that Moses was bodily assumed. It's just a tradition more than a teaching. But you remember how both Elijah, who we know was assumed in the fiery chariot, chariot and, and Moses both appeared in bodily form, um, and I think because they had their bodies. So I'm of that uh, school of thought that Michael the archangel not only rescued or snatched the soul of Moses away uh, from the grips of the demons, but, but also, and escorted him to the holy place, uh, or, but, but also that, in fact, his body as well, because he disputed with the body of Moses, all right? Monsignor, I want to jump in on I thought something really cool. We were just talking about the assumption of Moses. Of course, there's yeah. an ancient there's an ancient Jewish text called that. And yeah. and um if you go to the Sistine Chapel, the most ancient layer of the Sistine Chapel, which is not the famous stuff on the top, but it's a it's a run on both sides of the Sistine Chapel, the life of Jesus, okay, ending with ending the last one is this the ascension and the life of Moses which is his death, which tells you to understand the death of Moses in terms of the ascension. Yeah. 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 Jesus as a new Moses, right? Yeah. <laughs> Amen. 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 Now, by the way, there's a beautiful antiphon that we sing in, in, in the Roman rite. Um, Make choirs of angels escort you into paradise. So that's the English translation. In paradisum de ducante angeli, you know, so may the, may the choirs of angels escort you into paradise. May holy angels, may the holy angels welcome you into the heavens. So again, the idea of the angels when we die, escorting us uh, in our death up to the Lord, okay? So those are some both scriptural and liturgical roots of the role of the angels when we die. Now let's look at some of the insights of the fathers of the church. Tertullian says, when by force of death the soul, the soul is snatched from the weight of the flesh that closed it in, it trembles with excitement to see the face of an angel, the summoner of souls, realizing that his eternal abode has been prepared. So again, um, you might say, well, how does Tertullian know this? And again, he's probably just reciting a tradition, but you know, there's a lot of this stuff we have today, these near-death experiences and so on. Um, there may have been things like that where people, again, were caught away or were in the dying process and, and they were between sort of these things and they caught sight of angels. And um, we certainly, I certainly know that when I'm, I'm with people who are dying, they often say, like my, 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 my grandmother, Nana, when I was in the room with her, she said, well, Charlie, who is that standing next to you? And I said, what? I don't see anybody, Nana. She says, oh, oh, he's beautiful. You know, perhaps she was already seeing, you know, the angel who came to take her home. Or perhaps again, we, she also, at one point, she started to see people that I knew had died. Uh, she said, well, why is Aunt Polly here? And so that is, Aunt Polly, my aunt had died, you know, maybe 20 years before that. So again, there's a certain moment where some people who are dying sort of are in between. So again, I, I'll leave it at that. But I just say that, you know, so where did Tertullian get it? Well, I don't know, but where did we get some of these things, you know? But on the other hand, Tertullian and, and some of the fathers were much more rooted in the scriptures. And um, they were, as, as Father points out, uh, the fathers, uh, which Tertullian isn't really a father, but he's an historical reference, um, were holy men and uh, prayerful and deeply rooted in the scriptures and so on. 
Let's go on now and say St. Ephraim imagines the confusion of a man when he sees the heavenly angels just after death. He said, he, he, quote, he says, when the armies of the Lord show themselves, and when the divine commanders bid him to leave the body behind, he shakes and trembles, unaccustomed at the sight of these figures. As you know, whenever an angel appears in the Bible, the person is at first very disconcerted, and they sometimes fall on their faces, and almost the very first word out of an angel's mouth is, don't be afraid. <laughs> so I, I'm thinking, I think they don't show up looking like this, okay? <laughs> I'm just thinking, you know. The point is that it's not, it's, it, you'll, you'll see here in a moment, it's not just that it's disconcerting, but there, there's also a consolation. So let's keep reading. But as I say, we see now Origen says that immediately after the soul is, it leaves the body, there follows a separation of the just from the wicked, and they are led to the place they're deserving of. So again, there are probably some people who are disconcerted, and the angels lead them to places they, okay. Now, St. John Chrysostom said, um, if we need a guide, if we need a guide in passing from one earthly city to another, how much more so does the soul of someone uh, need, uh, the, 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 does our soul need someone to point the way when we break the bonds of the flesh and pass on into the future life? So I kind of bungled that, but basically, if I need sometimes a guide to get me from one city to another, even if it's a GPS guide, uh, if I need that just to get from one place to another on this earth, how much more so will I not need a guide to lead me through uh, uh, from this world uh, to the to the great city above, okay? And so obviously he's, he's talking about our obvious need for the angels to help us and escort us. I think Gregory the Great, now this is a beautiful thing. This is more on the consoling side of the role of the angels when we die. St. Gregory the Great says, the hymns of angels fill the soul with so divine a joy that it does not notice the sufferings of death at the very end. And during its voyage towards heaven, the angels scatter the demons who are trying to bar the soul's advance. And he notes that the angels, St. Gregory also notes that the angels of paradise are asked by the lower angels to permit the soul to enter there. So again, as the angels bring us up through the higher ranks and as we move up toward the heavenly gates, uh, the lower ranking, our guardian angel who, and, the, uh, and the angels who escort us ask the higher ranking angels to permit us to enter, to open up the gates and permit us to enter. Okay. And by the way, some of this may offend against some of your modern piety, like, well, I thought Peter was out the gate. You know? Or uh, what about, doesn't it say, you know, uh, doesn't Mary come, you know, now at the hour of our death, amen. And, you know, those are some of the things that we immediately think of. But remember, just like we talked about with the liturgy, to every human dimension of the liturgy, priests, deacons, lectors, so on, there is an angelic counterpart. You see the idea? And what we're focusing on here, we're not denying that Peter is an encountered or we're not denying that, that Jesus doesn't come maybe or, or that uh, certainly Mary as well, uh, but rather that the focusing on the angels because to every human uh, counterpart, there's also an angelic uh, counterpart, all right? Now, St. Aloysius Gonzaga, who is not among the fathers of the church, but he gives this beautiful reflection about, uh, and he's, he's summing up a, a lengthy tradition that came down to him in the 16th century. He taught that at the moment when the soul leaves the body, it is accompanied and consoled by its guardian angel so that the soul can present itself confidently before the judgment seat of God, of Christ. If the soul is sent to purgatory, the guardian angel will visit frequently and will, and will comfort and console that soul in purgatory, bringing the prayers that have been offered for it and assuring the soul of its future liberation, all right? Not so much that the soul of the angel enters into purgatory, but is able to reach them and, and console and remind them that this is temporary. At the moment of death, we, 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 our eyes kind of open up on the angelic world. And at first, the songs of the angels and the consolations of the angels ease, ease that moment of death. And then we, we open up our eyes and maybe we're disconcerted, but we're also consoled. And the angels take us and begin to move us up to the heavenly realms, passing the different landmarks and coming right to the gates of heaven and up to the judgment seat of Christ. And so this is the role of the angels. May angels lead you, escort you into paradise. Uh, may, they, may they bring you uh, uh, into the heavenly realms. So there's that beautiful idea, but there does come, of course, the judgment, right? The judgment. It, it, it's, it's, it says here, so I want to just, uh, the fathers, uh, the Eastern fathers particularly, refer to what we call purgatory as the river of fire. Let's, let's take three possibilities. Let's take the worst one first. We go to the judgment seat, and the judgment is, 
to hell. So what our guardian angel is not coming with us to hell, okay? Are we clear on that, all right? But but unfortunately, what does the guardian angel do? Well, God, the guardian angel must still rejoice in God's ultimate justice, in God's justice. Uh, and may escort, may escort the person toward the gates of hell, but does escort them there as necessary, all right? In the case of, of, of heaven, of course, the guardian angel enters in there and rejoices with the soul, with our soul. Now, the, the more usual thing is probably there's some time in purgatory, all right? Now, purgatory, as we know, is rooted in something that St. Paul wrote, uh, this idea of the river of fire. You're familiar with this passage, but let me read it. Everyone's work will become manifest, for the day of judgment will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. Now, if, if what he has built survives, he will receive a reward. But if it's burned up, he'll suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, but only as if through flames. So the idea is that in purgatory, we're, we're sent there. We're in friendship with God, uh, but we, um, we, uh, we need some, some of the, the bad stuff burned away. And the good things like gold and so on are purified by fire. And the bad stuff, you know, the, the lesser, you know, things, and not, not mortal sins, of course, but lesser faults and things like this, even also, I would say, sorrows or regrets or whatever we're, is clinging to us, these things like wood, hay, and straw are burned away in the river of fire in the, in the place of purgation, okay? Now, with that in mind, there is then, so let's have some commentaries now from the Father on the idea of purgation and the role of the angels there. The author of the Apocalypse of Paul, not written by St. Paul, but it's called the Apocalypse of Paul, speaks of a man lifted up into a mystical vision who sees a river of fire. And he asks what, what, uh, what it might be. And an angel says to him that if anyone is impure but repentant, he is led forward first to adore God. And then by command of the Lord, he is handed over to Michael the archangel and to other angels who baptize him, and that's in quotes, who baptize him in the river of fire that, uh, and then leads them to the city of God once having been purified. So... It would seem that the tradition suggests that the guardian angel isn't really involved in purgation at this point, but other angels like Michael and others are assigned to lead people uh, through this process of purgation, okay? Um, now, it goes on to say then, of course, then purification having been, um, you know, accomplished, then the guardian angel leads the soul into heaven. And so again, the guardian angel uh, may wait. I don't know. Is there waiting in the world to come? You know what I'm saying? You know, how, how, how is there time in purgatory? Does it happen quickly? Uh, you know, these, these things are unknown to us. But the fact that it must take place is, is, is certainly in the tradition. Let's say all that's been done. Now it's time to enter into heaven, y'all. This is just some beautiful stuff here. <clears throat> Eusebius, uh, uh, you know, there's, um, I'm sorry, as, as we're brought into heaven by our guardian angel, the fathers say that the angels have special joy when a virgin or a martyr is brought in. Listen to this. Eusebius says that virgins will not walk towards the king. They will be carried to him by the angels. Isn't that a beautiful idea, right? Um, they'll be carried to him, almost maybe on some kind of honor, honorific uh, you know, uh, thing. And they, they, so the virgins are, are this way. Now, of the martyrs, Origen says that the angels look at them with wonder and greet them as conquerors. And they sing, who is this coming from Basra with his, with his garments stained crimson? Who is this robed in splendor, striding forward in the greatness of his strength? That's a quote from Isaiah 6, 63 in verse one, right? It's a, the, the angels marvel at the glory of a martyr coming before them. St. John Chrysostom said, the martyrs go up, uh, go up to heaven, surrounded by and preceded by the angels as an escort. When they arrive, in heaven, all the holy powers from on high run forward and stand before them, trying to see their wounds. Imagine this. They receive them with joy and they embrace them. And then they form an immense procession and lead them right to the king of heaven, taking part in mystical songs and leading them into the holy of holies. You know, great stuff. By the way, you know, I don't know if any of you have been to Arlington uh, Cemetery for a full military burial. Uh, I've done a number of them because I live right here. But... I had, for example, believe it or not, about five years ago, I was asked to celebrate the funeral of a, of a, of a soldier who had died 10 years before I was born. His remains were found in North Korea and sent here, and I celebrated the, the funeral of a man who died 10 years before I was born in 1951. He died, and I was born in 61. And I did a full Latin Requiem Mass, and then we went over to Arlington, and because he had died in combat, it was a full military procession. 
Uh, we're talking a full caisson, um, horses, a complete marching band, and even a flyover uh, with, with planes. And it was a remarkable moment. And I thought, wow, you know, I was thinking a little bit of that as I'm reading John Chrysostom of the angel as just marveling in a, uh, as, a, as a martyr comes and um, they run forward to stand before them, trying to see their wounds, and they give them honor and receive them with joy and embrace them and form an immense procession to lead them right into the Holy of Holies to the King of Kings and the King of Martyrs. It's a magnificent image, isn't it, right? And, you know, how about for the rest of us ordinary people, right? You know, <laughs> fathers and mothers, married folks, priests, you know, I'm sure that there's a wonderful procession, too, for us as our guardian angel leads us forward and brings us right to the King of Kings and right into the Holy of Holies to be just just caught up and enthralled with God forever, right? So again, uh, they're, they're, they're looking at the big things, but to all of us, well, there will be a joy, a joy of our, with our guardian angels who will invite the other angels to rejoice with him uh, as we're escorted. So ba basically then, the angels, in terms of our death, Help the soul to escape the sufferings of death, okay? Likewise, and by the way, there's a lot of stories about the martyrs who seem to be almost like they would be in, in, in flames and they didn't seem to suffer, you know? Perhaps this, this is an image of the angels coming to protect them from the worst of the moments of death, right? Not that there's no suffering in our death, there, there clearly is, but that at least at the moment of death, there comes a moment of consolation or the angels come to console us. So the angels help the soul to escape the sufferings of death. The guardian angel accompanies the soul and assures it of a peaceful journey. Uh, our guardian angel defends us against demons who want to get in our way and stop us on our journey toward heaven. The angel goes along the way of the river. Um, uh, the, he leads, if, if necessary, he leads us to the river of fire where we're, our souls are purified. And while we're being purified there, I read you that text earlier, our guardian angel is interceding for us before God carrying the prayers of the faithful up to God for us on our behalf. Still then, maybe sending again signal graces by, from God uh, to us while we're in purgatory and reminding us that the time is short and that, that we'll be with God, okay? And then, um, the, the finally then, uh, he, he, when, when, when purgation is over, he greets us and bids the angels to open up the gates of heaven. The angels, and the, uh, uh, the angels of the gates then open up and they welcome the soul. And then special, as I said, special honor and joy is reserved for the virgins and martyrs. But all of us, our beloved children of God, and our guardian angel brings us right back then to, to the God who made us. The question I think came up last week, and I'll, I'll, I'll sort of end on this. What happens to our guardian angels after we die, you know? Well, there's, again, I've already said to you kind of three possibilities, right? If the soul enters into communion with God, our guardian angel uh, joins, um, uh, joins us in praising God. Uh, the one triune God for all eternity. So the main theory is that our guardian angel uh, enters heaven with us and rejoices uh, with us before God, um, joins in that heavenly band of, of praise of God. Now, if the soul enters purgatory, I've already said, uh, the angel neither needs purgation nor can it really participate directly. That's given over to other angels to perform, um, who baptize us with fire, so to speak, as Eusebius said. But the guardian angel does intercede for us. I've already gone through that. Now, as for those souls who go to hell, the angel can only praise God's divine justice and holiness, right? Can't go with us. Maybe takes us to the gates of hell, but that's it, all right? And bids us farewell. It, it isn't absolutely clear that if guardian angels take up other souls or duties after we die. Um, I think the, the, the wider consensus among the fathers as I've read them and that, that are in the book is no. That once that's done, the angel enters into heaven with us and rejoices with God forever and takes its place rightfully among the angels as we are among the saints, all engaged in that perfect praise of God and the angels' duties are done, so to speak. And I think that's the more strong position, but it's not like there's no one who assumes that maybe these guardian angels take up new souls and, um, and so on. But we'll, we'll have to leave that to the mystery of God, okay? All right, now we have about five more minutes for questions, but I hope, though, that you see... Um, just again, I want to maybe remind you, we are, if only our eyes could see, we're surrounded by myriads of angels. Yes, demons too, but myriads of angels working and ministering in and all around us and everything we do and, and all throughout creation and all throughout the cosmos. It's a magnificent and a glorious and a wonderful thing that one day our eyes will be open to see this invisible, yet very, very real world. Right now, we don't see it because of our sin, right? 
But I want to simply say to you that just because a blind man says there's no sun shining doesn't mean it's not shining, okay? And just because we're blind to this doesn't mean, well, I can't see it. Well, you know, by the way, I mean, you know, in deliverance ministry, I mean, we are blessed with some people we call seers who unfortunately they can see demons and they can tell us, you know, what's going on in a way that sometimes we can't. And um, there are a lot of exorcists that have learned to rely that certain people, not many, have a gift and it's a hard gift to have because they see these ugly demons for what they are and um, they can see demons and they can also see angels and so on so but not not completely and wholly and totally but in a fixed in a formal way so I, I already know that some people have that gift I, I know them personally okay comments questions yeah thank you Monsignor I know we've got a few people up here on our panel uh, Jane is going to take herself off of mute we got a number of questions here Jane uh, go ahead you have a question yeah, a comment. I, I've worked before with, um, it's been a while, but with home health care and hospice. And I always felt that at the moment, well, maybe not the exact moment, but in the dying process, there's so much grace that surrounds a person. And to be there and to be able to pray is such a privileged position. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm wondering, it's almost like participating with the ministry of the angels. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree with you more. I've had wonderful experiences that way too. I'll tell you one quick experience I had, and I, I don't know if it was the angels, I think it was actually the Lord, but, but what happened was there was a woman who'd been in a coma for about, oh, you know, several weeks, you know, just in a complete coma. And I came in to give last rites. The doctor says it looks pretty bad. She's probably, you know, her vitals are all down. Her blood pressure's dropping quickly. She probably won't last the day. So I went there and the family was all gathered in the room. And I came in with the blessed sacrament, although she couldn't receive communion, I could still give a blessing with the communion. So I walked in and no sooner had I walked in with the, with the picks in my pocket, suddenly this woman who had not said it or seen or said a thing, suddenly sat up in the bed. She said, oh, and then she just fell back dead. And I'm just convinced that she experienced the presence of the Eucharistic Lord. She saw him and maybe the angels as well. And that was it. But it was a beautiful manifestation in the true presence of the Eucharist and also the presence of the angels, as you say, surrounded by family and love. And some people get the privilege to die that way. And it's a beautiful gift. And uh, I'm convinced that ultimately, as I say, we've seen in the death of martyrs at times, their heroic uh, qualities, um, that somehow the angels are certainly consoling them at that moment. You know, Monsignor, I have to share a, a related moment of a friend of mine, a, an older priest who, when he was a young priest, he walked in, I was, he was newly appointed to the parish here that I'm a pastor of. And uh, um, among the people of the Middle East, there's this idea when the priest comes to visit you in the hospital, that's it, you're going to die. Okay? Mm -hmm. So he, wa he walked in the room. She saw him and screamed, oh, my God, I'm going to die. And she had a heart attack and dropped dead. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> so when the priest comes yeah. to you stay calm, please. Stay yeah, for some people, we do have that effect, don't we? <laughs> Isn't that bad? Yeah. It's not bad. It's that bad. <laughs> what, uh, uh, so we have a question. The, uh, the Cubans have it too. Yeah. Yeah. Telling us that they don't want the priests to come and give last rites to our grandmother who was very sick because they're afraid that she might die or that her husband would have a heart attack because he'd see the priest. Indeed. Wow. Yeah. Oh, bless That's the Lord, I tell you. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate, but, but clearly, and it, one of the things I think, at least in the Roman rite of Father I, we try to not so much, you know, we used to use the term extra unction, which is just a Latin word, which means a phrase, it means at last anointing. And you're kind of coming right at the moment of death if you can time it right. Whereas I think now we call it the sacrament of the sick, and that really one should be receiving sacraments long before that moment of uh, the articulo mortis sets in. Uh, but that just if someone is in, in poor health or in danger of death, uh, long before, long before. In in the in the Byzantine tradition, the the um, the same sacrament is given to all of the faithful for the healing of the soul and body. So my children have all received multiple times. It's mm. it's not, not, we don't have this idea that it's wait to the very last moment. Of course, yeah. we want to come there also to those that are dying. I just anointed a young man. Um, if you could pray for him, all of our participants. Uh, mm. His name is Kevin, and he passed away last night. I had uh, the the grace to be able to anoint him before he died. He struggled with drugs and he had a stroke, 
in his in his thirties. But uh, but no, this is a gift to to all of the faithful and uh, to be received for the healing of soul and body. Yeah, uh, Monsignor, we have a, a question about techniques to develop a personal relationship with our guardian angel to become more aware of their presence in our life. Well, I, I, in techniques, I'm I'm not so sure. I think that it's it's not so dissimilar from practicing the presence of God, right? I mean, I, I've said to you, most of you. I'm 57 years old, but I've probably been serious about my faith for about 35 of those 57 years. So my 20s were a little bit of a waste up to my through my 20s. But, you know, all these years of praying and, and focusing and thinking and praying on God, and I've become something of a mystic on the move, on the move. And I'm always seeing God's presence everywhere and the beauty of creation and the beauty of so many of you human beings I'm looking at right now and just the beauty of the Institute and so many ways. I'm just so aware of God's glory, his grace and his gifts. And this is called practicing the presence of God. And of course, among these gifts are, are again, his angels and uh, so many who minister quietly to us in hidden ways. So I, I think that uh, that's about all I can say. It, it's just going to be, sometimes people have little um, things, put, they put reminders around, you know? So like, for example, you know, some of the statues or angels or holy cards, uh, all of these are, are effective means. I think ultimately, you know, if, if there's just some little devotional thing that one can adopt, I don't know if you have ideas, Father, but... Um, no, I think just practicing that presence of the, you know, the, the, the presence of God in our life. And just, you know, on a very practical note, we have Lent, Lent coming. And there's so many distractions in our life and that stop us and that, that cut off this sense of wonder. And mm-hmm. we have to renew that sense of wonder if we're going to be able to see yeah. again. And uh, so I'd encourage mm-hmm. you to consider fasting from your television, from your cell phones, from your mm-hmm. radio. I remember when I was in Virginia, I did a lot of driving from Front Royal to the Northern Virginia area, back and forth. And I just during Lent, turn off the radio. Mm-hmm. Uh, have that time of peace in your car and, and think, you know, very yeah. practical steps to create the atmosphere so that we can begin to see and hear again. Sure. Yeah, and pray for the gift of wonder and awe. Yeah, great. Um, Monsignor, there's a question about the role of our angels in the sacrament of reconciliation. Yeah, didn't we t- talk a little bit about that last week, I think. But remember, we, we talked today about how the angels don't just console and, you know, make us feel good, but they also rebuke us, they'll at times punish us, they'll, uh, you know, reprimand us and so on. When we examine our conscience and so on, we can simply say, guardian angel, help me to see things. Help me to see some of the deeper roots of my sin. Uh, help me to have a sense of humor about myself. You know, I know I'm hard to love, guardian angel. Uh, I <laughs> I know I keep you busy. You're always running after me. You know, sometimes you see, every now and again, you see on the internet, there's a picture of an angel with a hand on his head. You know, <laughs> it's a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a, that's how I think my guardian angel must be sometimes. You're like, oh, <laughs> but so I think that, um, again, this is just another thing that I think we have to explicitly ask as we prepare for confession for the intercession or the help of our guardian angel who knows us better than we know ourselves and can also show us and assist us. Now, in terms of the sacrament itself, as with every sacrament, there is a there is a a, a ministry. So the priest, you know, at least in the in the in the Western rite, says, you know, God the Father of mercy through the death and resurrection of His Son has reconciled the world to Himself and sent the Holy Spirit among us for the forgiveness of sin through the ministry of the Church. May God grant you, you know, give you pardon and peace, and then the the absolution is given through the ministry of the Church. But of course, remember the Church includes the angels. Um, and they, 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 we talk, when we talked about the liturgy, to every human dimension of the liturgy, there's also an angelic dimension almost mirroring it, right? Now, not that the angel is the priest, but the angel is, if you will, bringing these graces to, from God to the priest and, and the prayers of the people back up. And so they're very involved, even as the deacons are involved in, in preparing the sacrifice, the angels are also involved at the spiritual level. So clearly... Uh, the angels are involved. And think how happy your guardian angel must be if you finally took a shower. Spiritual <laughs> shower, right? So, so, um, it, was it was getting close, you know? <laughs> you know, Monsignor, I just want to take an opportunity on behalf of everybody to say thank you so much for these wonderful insights, your guidance, and our spiritual life. Um, I have a little funny uh, story to share with you, and Angela's going to bring up this icon of St. Cyril of Alexandria, when you mentioned St. Basil and your disagreement with him, I had to give you, I got to give you a warning, Monsignor. So she's gonna, right. she's, Angela's going to pull up this icon of, of this is St. Cyril of Alexandria. You guys will notice 
that he, he, he's wearing a cap on his head, okay? That's a piece of cloth, and it doesn't match his vestment. Okay, now you know, pull this down, Angela. I'm going to tell, tell you why here. So here's the, here's the story. St. Cyril of Alexander, one of the great saints, author of the liturgy, at one point in his life, he questioned the orthodoxy of St. John Chrysostom, mm -hmm. and he was suddenly struck with a massive migraine headache for days he couldn't <laughs> get rid of it. And, uh, and finally, St. John Chrysostom appeared to him and took a piece of his vestment and gave it to him. He says, here, wrap this on your head and never deny the orthodoxy of uh, my orthodoxy again. It's like, oh, he's done with the picture of the piece of vestment on his head. Right, right. <laughs> anyway. Well, to my defense, Father, I, I'll say I was only disagreeing with Basil because uh, Eusebius said something a little different. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but anyway. I hope I'll be spared the migraine headache. <laughs> That's right, exactly, exactly. Um, so, you know, uh, for all of our participants, I want to thank you for being here with us, dedication to your education and information, um, and also to remind you that the Institute survives on your generosity and support. Uh, mostly, honestly, day-to-day, -day, as you do in your homes, uh, it's the regular monthly giving that helps us, our pledged support and commitment. Um, and, uh, and I just ask you to prayerfully consider that, that we, it costs a lot to run the Institute, but we follow the model of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and that is to never charge for what he has given us. Never forget your angels that are standing to your right and to your left, even as we speak present with us, as we fall asleep at night, as we wake up in the morning, as we go about our daily duties, they're there whether yeah. seen or unseen. And, uh, and just remember that you're in the presence of God when you speak, when mm -hmm. you act, uh, when you turn to your neighbor, when those people around you are maybe unkind or uncharitable. Mm -hmm. The angels are there with you to guide and to guard you. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.